this end, Dr. Vince Knight from Cardiff University today, who comes to give the keynote for the stochastic modeling talk and give us um, all his wealth of experience. So in particular, I think he's going to be talking about an overview of some applications of game theory to queuing networks and vice versa. So, thank Thanks a lot, Julie. It was really nice uh, to be asked to, to speak. I think I'm perhaps a bit of a fraud if you're expecting a lot of experience. Uh, but um, hopefully what I have to say is interesting. Um, I'm Vince, I'm a lecturer at Cardiff, but I don't put my title on the slides because you can read it in front of you. Um, that's fine, that's fine. Does anyone know what this is? Numbers, yeah, great. Almost a matrix, yeah. Payoff matrix, okay, yeah, great. So it's an it's a thing from game theory, um, and this one is a version of what's called the battle of the sexes. Um, and so, for example, uh, you could have um, Angelico, who wants to go eat at, let's say, Cafe Rouge, right? And um, Leanne, who wants to go eat at Burger King, all right? And those are their preferred restaurants. But they want to go eat together. That's more important than eating at their preferred restaurant. They want to go eat together. So Angelico controls the role, the role we're in, and uh, Cafe Rouge is there. That's a nice classy place. And then Burger King is, is down here. And then Leanne controls the column we're in. So Cafe Rouge is the first column, and Burger King is the second column. And then what we put inside of that are simply numbers that represent the utility of players, okay? So if um, if Angelico insists on Café Rouge and Leanne, because she'll go anywhere, decides, fine, I'll go to Café Rouge, then Angelico gets a three, because he's super happy, because he gets to eat with Leanne, and he's at the place of his choosing, cho choice. Um, Leanne's mildly happy, because she's with Angelico, but she doesn't get to eat a Whopper. Um, then over here, if Angelico said, no, no, I'm going to Cafe Rouge, Leanne says, screw you, I'm going to go to Burger King, and they both get a one, all right? Because uh, they're both kind of in their preferred choice, but they're alone. Right? Um, there's the opposite idiotic uh, situation where there's been a major miscommunication, and Angelico gets, go gets an, a whopper, and Leanne goes to Cafe Rouge, and they're both sad. Right? Because, because they're alone and in the wrong place. Um, and then finally, there's the symmetric situation. Okay? So this is a very simple game. It's, it's a game that sits in what's called a coordination game. Um, does anyone know what we do with these things? What should Angelico and Leanne do? Cooperate, but they, they make this decision, remember, do you realize students starting university this year were born in the same year that Harry Potter came, first came out? How terrifying is that? Um, well, anyway, back in those days, when you had friends and you had to coordinate to go to a, a place, you perhaps had to speak to them, God forbid, and, and had to make a plan for where you were going to go, or maybe just say, Let's meet later at the restaurant we like. So then Angelico and Leanne, they don't have their, their phones or whatever. They're distraught because they're like, which one does that mean? Does that mean the one that I like or the one, the one that you like? So what would they do? Toss a coin, perhaps? Yeah. What kind of situations can arise, right? If, let's say, if they start both going to Cafe Rouge. Yeah? Is Cafe Rouge the first one? They start both going to Cafe Rouge. What would they do the next time? Both go to Cafe Rouge again, right? In other words, if they're at this point, no one has a reason to move. Because if Leanne knows Angelico is going to Cafe Rouge, a deviation to Burger King would decrease her utility. Right? Um, and this was an idea that, I've forgotten your name, pardon me, Rand. Ran? All right. Ran. Ran. I'll go for Ran. Uh, this is an idea that Ran mentioned in his uh, great talk before. I really enjoyed it. 
where he said the idea of being an equilibrium is a point where no one has a reason to change. All right? So as long as that number is not 2, 1, or 0, Leanne doesn't have a reason to change if they're both there. Angelico similarly doesn't, right? Because he's only got the worst possible outcome. Like he's, he's managed to convince Leanne to, to be a bit more upper class and go to Cafe Rude instead of Burger King. And, um, and then it would be completely stupid for him to go to Burger King anyway, right? So, so this is what's called a Nash equilibria. Because it's a point at which people don't have a reason to move. This is also a Nash equilibria. So basically the symmetric illusion. That's two Nash equilibria. Now, the interesting thing um, about Nash equilibria is that for a well-defined game, I'll leave that definition of that, uh, there's always going to be an odd number of them. How many people think that two is odd? Great. So that means we're missing one. We're missing a type of behavior in this situation where people don't have a reason to move. Does anyone want to venture what that could You've already alluded to it. All right. Um, I said in my abstract, I was reading my abstract. Uh, my talk, and I was like, oh, I said I'll do that? Okay, so I'll, I'll do that. Um, I said I'd show off some software that allows you to study games, so I'll, I'll do that. Um, I don't know how many people know Sage. If you know Sage, it's, a, it's an open source uh, mathematics package that allows you to integrate, differentiate, solve equations, that kind of stuff. And um, you can use it for free at cloud.sigma. Um, like in fact, when you open uh, a project on cloud.sigma, you basically have a computer. It's a, it's a ridiculous tool. So here's the game that we just had. I create those two uh, matrices, and I create the normal form game. And if I look at the normal form game, it just says these are the utilities. If the first player takes their first strategy and the second their second strategy, then they get a utility of 1-1, one, one, et cetera, et cetera. And then if I just put in obtain Nash, you'll see it there. We've got, okay, here's one equilibria, which is both players going to Burger King. This is basically a probability distribution over the strategies. This is saying always pick the second strategy, always pick Burger King, and always pick Burger King. So this is a Nash equilibria where they both go to Burger King. This is a Nash equilibria where they both go to Cafe Rouge. And this is the other Nash equilibria where they're basically completely uncoordinated, and the first player Angelico goes to Cafe Rouge 75% of the time, and Leanne goes to Burger King 75% of the time. All right? But every now and then, they happen to be in the same place. All right? Now, the utility they get at this is worse than the utility they get here and here. Okay? Because uh, a lot of the time, they're going to end up alone. Um, but there's no reason to move from it. If you calculated the utilities there, there'd be no reason to move from it. That's very basic game theory. Um, and what I'm going to talk to you about today is kind of builds on that, and I'll talk about four pieces of work that myself and various people at Cardiff have done that takes that idea, sometimes very concretely, and sometimes a bit more indirectly, and, uh, and applies it to QE theory or applies to QE theory uh, to it, okay? Um, most of the examples, most of these four problems are motivated by healthcare. Um, at Cardiff, we have a really big healthcare uh, research um, group, and uh, so, so here we go. So, the first two problems are from the point of view of the users. This is very similar to Rand's work, where he's looking at users deciding to whether or not to scan and, and things like that. Um, uh, so, this is from the point of view, say, from patients in a healthcare system choosing some level of strategic behavior with regards to a queue. But it's from the point of the users. That's the important thing. So, don't worry too much about this. Just concentrate on this picture for now. That's called Pigou's example. And this is the simplest example of a game called a routine game. So, in Pigou's example, imagine that Every morning, people have to commute to work. And there are two ways to get to work. There's a very, very big highway. And no matter how many people use the highway, it takes an hour to get to work. So this, this does not suffer from congestion. Everyone who uses it takes, takes an hour. Um, then there's a shortcut. 
That's the one. It's the one hour to get to work. Then there's a shortcut. And the amount of time it takes to go there is the proportion of population that's using it of an hour. So if 75% of people, so 75% of the one unit of traffic that you have, if 75% of the people use the, the shortcut, they all experience 45 minutes um, to get to work. Okay? Obviously, a very, very simple model of, of traffic. So it's called a, a roofing game. And um, to use examples, very nice um, example of the problem, uh, so to speak, or the effect of selfish behavior. So if everyone goes along the highway, goes along the big highway, and they can look over the bridge and they can see this small little windy shortcut, they'll say, well, if I took that, at the moment, the congestion level over there is zero. So if I took that, it would take me zero units of time to go to work, right? Um, so going back to Burger King versus Cafe Rouge, I have an incentive to deviate my strategy. Yeah? I have a reason the next day to not be on the highway and to take this uh, short uh, shortcut. So perhaps half your traffic takes the shortcut, all right? So then half your traffic is experiencing an hour on the highway, and half your traffic is experiencing um, 30 minutes of, of commute. But then obviously the people that are still experiencing an hour, they're going to want to deviate. And eventually, in this simple model, the equilibrium flow, the equilibrium behavior, the Nash flow, is to have no one using the highway, everyone to use the shortcut, and so everyone's experiencing an hour commute. Does that make sense? Now, this, this analysis here is a very nice, powerful uh, result. It's not at all needed for this simple example. But basically, you can get a Nash flow by turning this problem, and in its generic sense, into uh, the minimization of a well-defined function. Okay? All about the details for that too much, but basically, if I have this function here, which is the function that's defined for that game, you minimize that, you get the Nash flow, which is no one taking the first arc, everyone taking the second arc. So what's nice about that is that you can then apply this to bigger problems where optimizing a function is easy and finding a Nash is not necessarily as easy. So this is the problem we looked at uh, however many years ago now. Um, some of my ex-colleagues and PhD students would be very bored of this because I've said it quite a few times. Uh, we looked at patient choice, um, patients choosing hospitals, and the effect of choosing hospitals as far as congestion is concerned. If everyone goes and picks the super shiny hospital with the really big parking lot, what is the effect on that for everybody? All right. Um, and so this is the routine game we built. So we say, all right, imagine you've got a matrix of various sources and various hospitals. So you've got M sources of demand, and they each have their own Markovian demand rate. You've got a distance matrix, and so on the network in the routine game, that just corresponds to a constant time. And then what you've got here is some sort of measure of congestion, some sort of measure that goes up with the amount of people that use it. For example, the expected weight at that hospital given a given arrival rate. Okay, and because of thinning and um, splitting that all of the Markovian process, that all that all works. To make it all work and not fall over, you have to bring in these other options, which is this cost beta, and we take that as a constant cost for people from this source to not get demand, to not get service. All right. Now that could be anything. That could be death, which comes at a high cost, or that could be interpre interpreted as, you know what, my, my bum knee surgery, the cost of, of waiting is just too long. I'm just going to leave, live with my bad knee. In a way, it doesn't really matter. It's more from a theoretical, you can make these as big as you want. Uh, but from a theoretical point of view, it's easy to make the mathematics work. What we could do with that is come up with all sorts of theoretical results. So for example, bound, bound twice an anarchy. And the price of anarchy is that ratio of the cost at Nash equilibria over the cost at optimal. So in other words, it's how much worse the system is when you act selfishly. Um, <clears throat> and we carried out various numerical examples. This is on an actual health network in, uh, in Wales, looking at surgeries, uh, knee surgeries. And this was looking at the price of anarchy. And so for, for want of a better approximation, 
a better description, pardon me, a green point around two means that at two, selfish behavior is making everyone wait twice as long uh, than they should do. So by, by individuals picking hospitals that are better for them, the situation is twice as bad. And I say wait with whatever these things are called, I always forget, um, because it's some sort of glorified weight where we're taking into account a utility of the weight. Okay. So this is really cool because um, what we see here is as demand grow grows in the system, we have no price anarchy, and that's basically there's no one in the system, there's lots of capacity, so the selfish decisions that are being made, and I say selfish as a game theorist, I don't mean that in a negative sense at all, I just mean completely rational. Uh, Self, I always get into this where I say the word selfish a lot, and people go, oh, there's nothing wrong with being selfish. And blah, blah. It's like, oh, selfish, I just mean rational. I just mean doing the correct thing. All right. Uh, so uh, the rational decision here uh, doesn't make a difference because it's just not many people. So if you're making the wrong decision, there's so much capacity, it's not a problem. Up here, we see that the price anarchy starts going down. A lot of times, people see this graph and go, awesome. That means everyone's super happy. No. That just means that the system is so uh, congested, so full, that the selfish decisions don't make a difference. Everything is terrible. Okay? So here, everything is good, it doesn't matter what you do. Here, everything is terrible, it doesn't matter what you do. Uh, but then we've got this point here. We have a very high price of anarchy. And that's basically, in fact, where the actual system was. And so that's more or less where you're always going to be pro for a public service. Because with the public service, you just have enough capacity. And so that's the point where the selfish actions can really, really have a high impact. And in general, you'll see a lot of these price anarchy graphs from me where they go up and go down. Because I look at the effect of down lambda is getting pushed through the system. And so that's why I asked mm -hmm. Ryan if he'd done it. <laughs> uh, so that's, that, that's published. Price anarchy in public services. And um, we have some numerical examples that I've just shown you in there but also looking at uh, school choices, for example. So another piece of work, again, from the point of view of a user, is something like this. So if something's wrong with you, say you get a really bad splinter, uh, you could perhaps wait to go see um, a consultant, say, or um, you could go straight to the A&E, perhaps. Yeah? And uh, skipping one of those steps could be considered a cost, all right? Uh, so what we're looking at here is someone arrives, and in stark contrast to the model I just showed you, they observe the system, all right? In the model I just showed you, people are making probabilistic decisions. But here, you observe the system, and based on what you see, so I see there are three people here, one person here, you make a decision to skip zero queues, so join straight away, skip one queue, or skip the whole queue, the whole system, all right? Um, and so this is actually a very tricky problem to deal with. Your policies to what everyone's doing looks like this. So <clears throat> your rows correspond to the number of people you see in the first system, and your columns the number of people you see in the second. So, for example, if there's no one in the system at all, if your system makes sense, the correct decision that this policy is indicating you to do is to skip zero queues. But then, as people start joining and being in the first queue, perhaps your policy says, well, skip the first queue, because at this point there's still no one in the second, and so go straight to the second. All right? Then, perhaps when we're here, as people join the second queue, what this is telling us is, all right, as people join the second queue, it's still worth skipping the first queue. Now, all of a sudden, there's so many people in the second queue, you should actually join the first queue and wait for the second queue to exit. So in, the, in, in terms of a stochastic process, what we're basically saying is around here, these states are weird. And so this, this state should, won't, won't happen for long. And then eventually, it's barrier two. It's like, oh, the whole place is so congested, just, just skip it. So that's what a policy looks like, all right? <clears throat> and to be able to then study what's the best policy from a self-fit or a social point of view, we have to define cost. So the cost of a queue, this is relatively straightforward. It's just how long is it going to take me to go through one queue. So if there's 
If there's room in the queue, so the number of people there is less than the number of servers, it's just my length of stay. If there's more, then I need to make sure there's enough room for me, okay? Um, and so then the cost of joining the queue based on skipping zero queues, one queue, or both queues, when I see ij, I'll start down here. If I skip both queues, my cost is beta 2. That was just the constant I'm giving. If I skip one queue, it's this cost of skipping one queue plus that at the second queue, yeah? If I skip no queues, it's the cost at the first queue plus the cost at the second queue, yeah? There's something incorrect on this slide. Does anyone want to take a guess at what it is? So when I join so when I skip zero queues when there's I people in the first and J in the second, my cost at the first would indeed be given by this, okay? Because that's just how long we took. But the thing is, when I come out of the first queue, when this has happened, there is no reason to assume that there's going to be J people in the second queue still. So if I turn up and there's two and three, and I join, by the time I come out, there might be five at the second queue. It might be zero at the second queue. It might be 10 at the second queue. And that's what makes it very difficult. So the way to handle it is we define a Nash policy to be a policy that's a best response to itself. So if you make the, the assumption that everybody is following a particular policy T, so a particular matrix of zero and ones, right? then you can basically write down the underlying Markov chain of when I join the first queue, I can figure out what the expected number of people will be by the time I finish it, if everybody is following this, all right? And then what you do, uh, and this is very much worked in progress, and it seems to work, uh, using what's called the best response uh, dynamic algorithm, you start with a policy and say, okay, everyone's doing this. So everyone skips both queues when there's five, three, or everyone skips one queue when there's two, four. Um, what should I do if I know what everyone else is doing? Okay, I said, well, I know everyone else is gonna skip there, so I'm actually gonna join. Okay, and you make those decisions, and you keep on replacing the policy you had with the best response to it. And you keep on doing that until the two policies are the same. And so the, what, the best response to what you're doing is what you're doing, okay? Um, interestingly, it seems like it takes about four or five rounds to converge uh, on that, uh, but that's very much work in progress. So here are some example policies. And you see this is the, se the, the selfish policy where we seem to have this characteristic uh, T tilde. This is the social policy. So this is obtained using dynamic programming. So this is the best for everyone. And what this is very interesting to say is that it says, all right, in the states where there's nobody, just skip the first few straight away, go fill up the second to get a bit more of a smoother transition through the system. How am I doing for time, Julie? Cool, so about halfway through, yeah? Perfect. So we can calculate the cost, we can calculate the price of use for this particular system, we get a ridiculously high price for that. And this is the plot I like, so it goes up and goes down for the exact same reasons, that when lambda is low, it doesn't matter what you do, everything's great. And when lambda is high, it doesn't matter what you do, everything's terrible, okay? So those are two pieces of work. The second piece of work is, okay, that's all great. We're basically all idiots making stupid, rational, correct decisions. Uh, but what about the people who control the system and may be able to deal with our stupid, rational, correct decisions. Um, and so this will lead on to, to two pieces of work that actually use much more classical game theory, um, like the, the battle of the sexes that I described um, at the start. So here's the first piece of work that was work done with Isabella Comenda, um, who now works for a, a local health board. Um, and during her PhD, she was studying critical care units. And um, she looked at the data, and she uh, fitted a, a model, and it did not match up. Right? And 
uh, did not match up with the actual distribution of the state of the system. Um, she tried various models, she tried all sorts of models, and basically at some point she tried a model where the arrival rates depended on the states of the system. So as the system got fuller, perhaps less people started turning up. Now in practice, that's not how it happens on a critical care unit. Well, not what you would think would happen, right? You think that people fall over at a rate of 10 a day, whether or not my critical care unit, I'm not going to fall over less or more, right? But she was able to get more or less a perfect fit by considering this, this model. Um, and so we went and spoke to uh, the critical care managers and said, listen, we found something interesting. You know, if you actually happen to perhaps be controlling the arrival rate, I don't know how you do it, then, um, you know, we've got a really nice model for, for your system. And uh, they, they said, oh, well, actually, we kind of do. We kind of do do that. As we get full, perhaps not, it's not written in stone. It's not, you know, we don't know exactly what the cutoff point is. Uh, but as we get full, we probably do divert some of our patients to another hospital. And we're like, okay, great. And we carried on that piece of work. And then we started another piece of work. And in, in this uh, collection of work, the second piece was actually the thing that I thought was the most interesting. And when it came, came to uh, Isabella's PhD viva, the external just said, oh, and I didn't read the chapter, so I'm sure they're fine. Uh, I actually thought they were the best piece of work in there. But um, the idea is this, is that, okay, you've got a certain cutoff point for one of the hospitals and a certain cutoff point for the other hospital, right? And the arrival rate that each hospital is given by four values dependent on where we are. So if I'm here and I cut off, so to speak, right? So I'm there with my, my, my patients, then my arrival rate will probably be lower. But the other hospital's arrival rate here will probably be higher because they're getting some of my patients as well as theirs because they are not in cutoff yet. Okay? Um, down here, theoretically, maybe both our arrival rates are lower. Depending on the model we use, perhaps here is the point where both our arrival rates are just the same. So these two points, we take care of the other person. But here we go, all right, we're both full. We'll both take care of our own. The work we did kind of allowed you to decide whatever they were. I don't expect you to look at that any more than to see it's a nice pretty picture. Uh, but this is basically marker chain. Uh, and if you think about it, it's just a super superimposition of what we had before, where we now have these cutoff uh, lines. And so what's changing is the values on these arcs uh, that allow our transitions between states. Okay. This one you can look at. <laughs> so uh, here we see the arrival rates go from being in region B to region D, C to D, right? So once we've done that and we've built this, this stochastic model for, for our system, we can write out our two matrices, which are just the same thing we did to describe the battle of the sexes. What we do is we say, all right, let's assume both hospitals are told to work particular target utilization. I won't go down to very much because it, it would be said on a soapbox. But it's a very stupid idea, but it's one that's used a lot. Um, and the idea is, okay, let's get the utility really close to a target. All right? So every hospital should aim to get 80% utility, 20% utility, 90% utility. What, what's the best? Okay. Um, we actually get the utilities from the Markov model for every a pair of cutoff points. We were able to prove a really nice result, which shows that there will always be a Nash equilibrium in what's called pure strategies. So you remember with the battle of the sexes that we had those three types of utility, both of them at Burger King, both of them at Cafe Rouge, both of them 75% of the time eating alone. Um, that middle one is called a mixed strategy. And uh, we were able to show that you'll always get at least one Sure, Nash equilibria, and so, and also through the proof, um, we actually found a very nice, quick way of finding Nash equilibria. You basically had a line going up and another line going up, and you follow these lines and you find the point that they meet. So you can actually compute equilibria for quite large games relatively, relatively simply. And um, this is a plot of the POA. 
So the price of energy. And in other words, this is a measure of, okay, this uncoordinated behavior between the hospitals that's happening, what is the effect? So how bad is it? And what we're doing here is we're saying, I'm not plotting the price of anarchy, I'm plotting the smallest target value that minimizes the price of anarchy. So from the point of view of control, it's like, okay, I'm going to try and coordinate behavior between the two CCUs by picking a target value. I'm not just going to pick 80% because that was once in a paper a long time ago. I'm going to try and pick it, try and incentivize people in the right way. And I want to pick the lowest targets from the hospital screen the most time. And so that's why it makes sense to look at R min. And this is just a scaling of demand. And so here, at the actual demand that's on the system, it's saying that the value that incentivizes the hospital in such a way as to align their, uh, their interests with the common good is around 72. But as demand goes up, well, then your target is going to go up as well. Okay? That's one example. Um, that's hopefully going to be accepted soon. Right. The last piece of work um, I'll talk about is, uh, is this one. Um, so this is the action emergency unit at Cardiff. Um, does anyone know why I took a picture of it? You can see two of the hospital beds there. Anyone see the hospital beds? Funny. Anyone see the hospital beds? Where are the hospital beds? The two ambulances. In this picture, these two ambulances are hospital beds. Um, and this is all again to do with targets. Uh, so, action emergency departments have very difficult targets um, to deal with. And one such target is um, when a patient comes in, a clock stops, and in four hours' time, that patient must be gone um, upstream or, or go home or whatever. That's a loose description of the targets, it's slightly more complicated than that. But basically, when someone walks in the door, the targets go. The result of that is that when they're full, which they often are, because emergency departments are very busy places, when an ambulance turns up, if the person is relatively stable, which isn't going to get a lot worse, um, the emergency unit says, we're not ready for you. We don't have room for you. Uh, and so that means that the clock doesn't start for that particular patient. Um, and so they wait in the ambulance. All right? That's fine from the point of view of the hospital the patient. I'm sure it's very well looked after. The problem is that these hospital beds are no longer ambulances that could be going and getting somewhere else. All right? So this piece of work, which is again an ongoing piece of work, uh, looks to model that as a um, three-player game. So our three players are two hospitals, a hospital down here and a hospital up there. And the third player is the ambulance service. So what the ambulance service is going to try and do is go to the hospital that minimizes its expected weight before it gets served. All right. The model we take for the hospital is a very simple one. Um, it's a queue in tandem, where this is our emergency unit. And this is an upstream ward. Now, it's a queue in tandem with a very particular aspect that's very important. Because the little story I just said about the ambulances and the action emergency systems make it sound like the action emergency systems are, are evil. But the problem is the action emergency system, they have upstream blockage. They got loads of people they want to get rid of, but the wards can't take them yet. All right? Now, I'm making the, the wards sound like the bad guys. The wards have their own problems. Like it's, it's, it's a very complex problem. So this is a tandem queue with blocking. Even if you're done, you can't leave here until there's room for you here. OK? And so this is what's called a Stackelberg game. It's named after Stackelberg. And it's basically a game where some people move, know what's happening, and then the other people move. All right? So we have the two hospitals. Let me go back a slide. I forgot to mention something. What we say is, this hospital has big C capacity. And the strategic decision that this hospital makes is, how much of that capacity do 
do I put in the A and E? And how much of that capacity do I put in the ward? Now again, this is used loosely because obviously a ward bed is not the same thing as an A and E bed. A ward physician is not the same thing as an A and E physician. So it's some proxy of a discrete measure of capacity. All right. Um, so hospital one or hospital two make the strategic decision in an uncoordinated fashion. That's what the the dash dots mean. So they kind of make it at the same time. They don't know what the other person has done. And then the ambulance service, they know the capacity of both hospitals. They don't know the state of both hospitals. They know the capacity. So they know that hospital has gone really, really friendly to us and put 20,000 beds in the A&E. Right? Um, and that hospital just has one bed in the A&E. So they're not, they're not friendly to us. So that's what they know. And then what they do is they basically share out their demand in a probabilistic fashion in pretty much the exact same way as Pigou's example of the they say, all right, 20% of our ambulances are going to go there and, and, and 80% um, there. And then the, the game we're looking at is hospital one and hospital two try to minimize the difference in utility between their ward and, and their AE, and the ambulance tries to minimize the, their expected weight. Um, this is very much work in progress. We've actually changed this model slightly um, to use a different utility, but for the purposes of today, I, I, I'm sure this will do. Now, what becomes interesting is that I now need, for the ambulance player, to be able to find out, if I find the hospital in the given state, what is my expected wait? So if I know there's four people here and two people there, how long am I expected to wait? Where of those four people here, two of them might just be blocked. All right? Now, a lot of people have done work looking at um, tandem cues, but there's not much work that's been done on the expected wait of, of them. Um, and we found a mildly satisfying solution to that problem. I say mildly because I mean not satisfying, but it worked. Uh, so the idea is you build a two dimensional Markov chain of the system. You might think that it should be a three dimensional problem, that you need the number of people that are here, the number of people that are here, and the number of people that are blocked here. Okay? Uh, but you can collapse it to a two dimensional problem where it's basically the number of people that are here or waiting to go here, so including this red dot, and the number of people that are here or waiting to go here. So that means these two people, whilst they're physically located here, only the blue dot is here in terms of a classical queuing model. Okay? And so what happens is these servers become waiting rooms, which is exactly what happens in, in real life um, as terms of what the model represents. So once you've done that, you can write down the transitions between your states in, in your model. They're relatively straightforward. You just get these sorts of expressions that kind of count how many of your people are blocked. So if I know that I've got two beds in the second system, but my, my second dimension for this state is four, then that means that I've got two people that are there and two people that are blocked waiting to go there. Okay, so just that kind of idea. This is what the a small market chain looks like. Um, it's no longer square because we've got this thing going down here. And at any point where the number of people in the second dimension, so the people in the second queue or waiting to go in the second queue, is bigger than the number of servers, the number of room, that means we have blockage. Yeah? You go to Geraint's talk tomorrow, he'll, he'll be talking a bit about that kind of stuff. Do go to that, it's a really nice piece of work. Um, so we can build a model, simulate it, we can go, yeah, we've got a, a nice, nice agreement between the analytic approach and, and a simulation approach. So then what becomes difficult is okay, if we know the probabilities of being in a given state, that's only the half the battle. I want to also find out what my expected weight is. Right? And that's what's slightly Difficult. So the expected weight would be if I sum over absorbing states, so in other words, states at which I'm allowed to join the queue. So in other words, I decide in this model that if you're lost, you don't wait. But I don't want to count you either as a weight of length zero. Does that make sense? Because then I could have an expected weight of zero by just allowing no one in. Yeah? So I'm only counting people that actually do get in. They're not lost to the system. Um, 
And then all I need to do is take a probability to pi ij on the numerator there of being in this state times the cost of being in this state. And by the cost, I mean the expected weight of being in this state. The expected weight of being in this state depends on the expected weight of being in this state and the expected weight of being in this state. Because from this state, I'll go to this state. Yeah? And so what we do is we write out a recursive formula, and eventually, this is the point where I'm no longer waiting. And so you can write this recursively, um, which means it can be computed immediately, and um, and that works that works nicely. Um, and so there you get a mean expected weight formulation. That's the recursive formula for it there. A mean expected weight as a value of lambda. And there are some box plots there for the simulated result. The fact that you can't see them clearly is actually very good because they're basically exact. With little or no variation. <clears throat> so then, this function here is just the difference in the weights of the different Qs. So, once I've got a way of calculating W1 or W2, as an ambulance sends more ambulances to the first station, what is the difference in the weight? So, it starts with a negative difference, a positive difference, and what's important, and you can prove it with a couple of sentences really is that this function f is monotonic. And because it's monotonic, that means that we can find a lambda that equates the weight at both uh, hospitals. This is just the same plot for varying p. I probably shouldn't have put it in. <laughs> so once we do that, so once we calculate the expected, the value of lambda that the ambulance will use, so where the ambulance will go for given c and, and, and other value of C. We can write down the games for the first and the second hospital as the difference of the utilities. Once we've done that, we can solve this um, to get the Nash equilibria. We solve that game to get the Nash equilibria. And then we can compute this social value cost, which gives us a, a price of anarchy. So there we have a price of anarchy of 1.3. So the selfish actions of all three players were the ambulance is kind of acting the least selfishly. The hospital is acting the worst. I say worst in a game theoretic sense. Uh, don't attach any emotion to that. Um, this is how you calculate um, the price of anarchy. You minimize this value of S, which is just the expected uh, number of lost patients. And uh, you get the Cs from the A and the B. You get the A and the B for the game. You get that from, from this function. And that function f was the expected weight in the tandem q. And then from there, this is kind of brand new. Um, this is what the price of anarchy seems uh, to, to look like. I'm not quite sure what it means yet. And that's the effect of lambda. So for high lambda, we're seeing that this, um, this social behavior is, again, minimizing itself out after a certain amount of time. So it doesn't matter about all the bad decisions that are being made. Everything's terrible. So to finish off, I don't know how I'm doing for time, but I hope I'm not running. There's a lot of use for game theory mixed with Markov models. Um, any types of stochastic modeling. My first foray into this was a simulated model where I had individual treatment of the um, you can do both. You can model, I say patient, I should have said user, user and controller behavior. And like for the final game that I showed you, the three player game, you can do both at the same time. And um, there's loads of theoretical mathematics that can be done. Um, a great PhD student at Cardiff, uh, who's finished last year, the year before, Rob Schoen, did all sorts of interesting stuff, looking at the idea of getting policies. Uh, and, and, and showing that, that the, the general idea that selfish users make things busier, which is what you see a lot in this type of behavioral, uh, strategic or driven behavior, um, holds in uh, various general, uh, general cases. And there's also room and scope for all sorts of applied contributions as well. If you'd like a copy of these slides, you can find them there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a reason that I can begin to give, but I can't promise it's the reason. Is it the reason? So what you see here is that you're, you've got a, a mix of this continuous behavior, which is what the YAMLs is doing. It's all very continuous, right? Um, their strategy is some sort of value that you learn by. And then that's being mixed in with the discrete behavior of the hospitals. So where you see these steps, they coincide with, so these are, this is plotting the equilibrium strategies for both hospitals as well. Um, so what you're seeing here is, yep, yeah, at this value of lambda, the ho first hospital has a C value of one, and then we have a jump, I'm guessing it's hidden behind here, and then another jump here. So what's happening is that those strategic things are very different. And in the same way that in the Battle of the Sexes game, uh, the utilities don't really matter, the actual value of utilities doesn't really matter. It, what really matters is the relationship between the utilities. Um, I believe there's some explanation around there for that. I believe. <laughs> but it's, it's a good question. It's one I've been trying to answer for the last couple of months. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much.